Hey guys, another week, another class. Here we go. So today is week 23. Next to the last week, next Tuesday is our last class. I can't believe it. Um, I hope you guys are doing well. We are doing good at my house. Just trying to keep from going nuts, I guess. Um, but everything is good. I hope you all are good. I haven't heard from anyone, so I'm assuming everyone's doing really good. Again, I just want to let you guys know if you need anything at all, if y'all are stumped on something, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is our last week to work on that final paper. So this week, I hope that y'all can give a lot of attention to getting your paper, um, making it a masterpiece. Um, for grammar today, we are going to do, um, you know, quite a bit of review and I'm just going to do several sentences over and over and over again. And then other that, the, other than that, the only new thing is to learn our very last verbal, which is, which are gerunds. And so we're going to talk about those today. Um, so let's just dive right in. Okay. So I'm going to start out by doing this uh, sentence right here that I've already written on my board. So it says, the Bible, which is God's holy word, gives me strength and courage. All right, so let's go ahead and parse this and question confirmation it. Let me put my knee up to hold my... Now, I can immediately look at this and see that I have a who, which clause in there. So I know that that who, which clause is a subordinate clause. So if I'm looking at my main sentence here, I can very easily see, especially because these commas help point it out to me, I can very easily see that my main sentence, my independent clause here is, the Bible gives me strength and courage. So let's go ahead and parse that one. The Bible gives me strength and courage. What gives me strength and courage? Bible, subject, noun. What is being said about Bible? Bible gives, verb. Bible gives what? Strength and courage. Do you guys see this conjunction right here? So the Bible gives me strength. Bible gives me courage. Can strength or courage replace or rename Bible? No. So this is direct object, direct object. We have a compound direct object here that is joined by that fanboys conjunction and. All right, and then Bible gives strength and courage to whom? Me. This is your indirect object. Oh, I forgot to put that our verb is verb transitive. And then this we know is just an article adjective, okay? So if you guys can guess, the pattern that they're wanting us to review is our SVT IO DO. Now remember that indirect object is always going to appear in between your verb and your direct object, okay? And that question that you ask is, verb direct object to or for whom or what. So give strength and courage to whom? Me. All right. And that's your indirect object. Now let's look at our who, which subordinate clause here. And we can go ahead and question confirmation that. Which is God's word? Um, which is going to be, it's, it's awkward when you ask it in that question form, but always know in your who, which clauses that who and which is going to be the subject pronoun of your sentence. Okay. So this is your subject pronoun. Um, what is being said about which, which is verb, which is what word. Can word replace or rename which? Yes. Does which equal word? Yes. So this is actually a predicate nominative and our verb is verb linking. And then we have, um, we just have a couple of descriptive words here. We know that this, because we see this apostrophe S here, it's a possessive. So it's a possessive adjective. Whose word? God's. That's an adjective. And then, um, what kind of word? 
the holy word. Holy word, that's an adjective as well. So you just have a couple of modifying words there. Okay? Now, what I would love for you to do is, right now, the structure of this sentence is complex, meaning it has one independent clause and at least one subordinate clause. But we've been working with that last structure, which is our compound complex, which means we should have at least two independent clauses and at least one subordinate clause. So what I would like you to do right now is pause the video and on your own paper, take this sentence, which is complex, and turn it into a compound complex. And just take a minute to do that, pause the video, and then come back. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and put another sentence up here for us to work real fast. And again, this is just good review. Okay, so for those taking notes, I'll start dictating the sentence as I'm writing it on my board. Okay, so you can start writing it. This sentence is, pay Jack his wages when he works on Saturday. Pay Jack his wages when he works on Saturday. Okay, so when I'm looking at this sentence, there's a couple of things that I notice right off the bat that can make this easier for me as I go to parse this sentence. I see a conjunction right here. You guys see it? It's one of our www.asia.webs. This is a subordinating conjunction, when. I know that that is introducing a subordinate clause, okay? So you guys can see when you circle this, it lets you see that subordinate clause come into focus. When he works on Saturday, okay? So when he works on Saturday is a subordinate clause, all right? So my main sentence is, pay Jack his wages. Now, the other thing that I noticed about that is that this is a command. This is a commanding sentence. That means it's imperative. And what is the subject of an imperative sentence? Always, always, always. It's always, always, always our implied you. Okay? So this sentence is imperative, and we're going to have an implied you. You pay Jack his wages. Who pay Jack his wages? You. Subject pronoun. What is being said about you? You pay. Verb. You pay who? Jack. Can Jack replace or rename? Um, no, pay. I'm sorry. For, forget I said that. <laughs> you pay what? What are we paying? We're paying the wages. Can wages replace or rename you? Nope, so that is our direct object. Our verb is verb transitive. And then pay wages to whom? Jack. This is our indirect object. We're not paying Jack. We're not paying someone with Jack. So that's where I got that messed up a minute ago. What are we actually paying? We're paying the wages. Paying the wages to whom? To Jack. This is our indirect object. Okay, now this right here, his, this is a possessive um, adjective. It's a pronoun adjective. So it is whose wages? His. So this is an adjective. Okay. Now look at our subordinate clause. We know that when is our conjunction. It's already circled and labeled. So he works on Saturday. Who works on Saturday? He, subject pronoun. What is being said about he? He works, verb. Now, we don't have anything that comes after this because if you look at this on Saturday, that should jump out at you guys as a prepositional phrase. So there's no other nouns that come after works for us to ask the direct object questions about. So we know that this is a verb intransitive, okay? And then we have this prepositional phrase that has developed here on Saturday. This is your preposition, and this is your object of the preposition, okay? So, um, 
This right here is also a complex sentence. It has one independent clause and one subordinate clause. So if you guys wanna pause again, just for review, if you feel like you need to, moms, you can pause the video again and have them make it a compound complex. So you would need to add another independent clause. Okay, so reviewing this week, that is your um, that is your sentence pattern that they want you to work with this week and just make sure that you really have a clear understanding of it is that SVT, IO, DO. So having that indirect object in there. Okay, so for charts this week, they want you guys to review adverbs, okay? So we reviewed adjectives already. This week they want you to review chart I, which is your adverbs. Now the adverbs chart is a lot smaller, um, but the adverbs have a lot more questions. Remember, this is what is important to know are all these adverb questions. So how, when, where, why, how often, how much, to what extent, under what condition. All right, and then knowing that you have the four different types, okay, that um, these, uh, some of these adject, um, adverbs have degree to them. They can have degree. Um, and just making sure that you know all of these four different types and copy this chart a few times this week. This is going to be your um, review chart for this week. Now, one of the things that I wanted to point out to you guys about adverbs is that adverbs can modify other ad adjectives. So adverbs modify not only verbs, but other adjectives, okay, and other adverbs in the sentence. And so that is um, something that's mistaken a lot. Um, some very common, you know, one of the things that the guide points out this week is that some very commonly mistaken adverbs are the words very, the words so, which we actually use a lot in our uh, language um, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, a, almost a slang term, but we use it a lot. That is so awesome. Um, quite, still, and rather. These are all adverbs that are usually modifying other adjectives. And so sometimes it can be hard when you're um, parsing your sentences to pinpoint them. So let me give you an example. Okay, the car was being driven, okay, and at, when you guys hear that, was being driven, you should automatically know that that's a verb phrase, was being driven. It's helping verbs with your verb, verb driven. Um, very fast, okay? So looking at this sentence, the car was being driven very fast. Sorry for that glare that my window puts on this. The car was being driven very fast. Now, the main sentence here, think about it. The car um, was being driven very fast. You have this fast here, which is car equals fast, but this very right here is an adverb that is to telling to what degree it was fast, okay? Um, another one, another example. So that would be labeled an adverb when you see that word, very. Um, look at this one. He considered the painting so beautiful. Okay. So looking at this sentence right here, he considered the painting so beautiful. Beautiful here is an object complement adjective. Okay, what did he consider? The painting. He considered the painting, but it, he didn't just consider the painting and he didn't consider beautiful. He considered the painting beautiful. It needs that complement there. So this is an OCA, painting equals beautiful, object complement adjective. And when you put this word so here, it's modifying this adjective here. So that is an adverb. So right here is an adverb, okay? So that's what they're wanting to point out to you guys is to remember that these adverbs modify other adjectives as well, okay? So some of the other ones they said are mistaken a lot. Um, 
so very quiet. So think about a sentence like this. The paint was still quite wet, okay? The painting was still quite wet, the, or the paint was still quite wet. So paint is your subject, noun. What was still quite wet? Paint. What is being said about paint? Paint was, verb. Paint was what? Wet. Can wet describe paint? Yes, so this is a predicate adjective. Okay, now to what degree was it wet? It was still and quite. These are adverbs because they are modifying an adjective. This is a predicate adjective. Still and quite are modifying that adjective. So that makes them adverbs. So those would be labeled adverbs. Okay, one more example of this, these adverbs that are a little more obscure and hard. Let's see, Ben was rather hungry after his workout. Ben was rather hungry after his workout. Okay, Ben was what? Hungry. Can hungry describe Ben? Yes. Okay, so hungry is a predicate adjective here. And Ben was hungry. Ben equals hungry. To what extent was he hungry? Rather hungry. Because this is an adjective, predicate adjective, this rather is an adverb. Okay? And then you guys should see that there's a prepositional phrase there at the end, after his workout. That's a prepositional phrase. Okay? Okay, so um, just adverbs this week, adverbs chart. And like I said, copy this chart several times. Make sure that you're really good on, on adverbs. Okay, and then the new thing this week are our verbals. Okay, so chart Q. This is the last verbal that we have to learn. And these are gerunds. Okay, so a gerund is a present participle verb form that is used as a noun. Now remember, your five principal parts of verbs, infinitive, present past, present participle, past participle. The present participle is a verb plus ing. So if you have the word run and you break that into its principal parts, it's a little bit irregular, but it's, it would be to run, run runs, ran, running, ran. And so the present participle form is that verb plus ing, running, okay? So when you have a present participle form and you use it as a noun, remember these verbals are verbs that are acting as a different part of speech. They are not acting like the verb in the sentence. So when you have this present participle, the verb plus ing, and you use it as a noun in the sentence, that is your gerund, okay? So let's look at um, some examples. Now remember, a noun is a person, place, thing, activity, or idea, okay? So these gerunds, when you use them in your sentence, they're usually going to be activity nouns um, because they, they're, they're some sort of activity that is, it's, a, it's that verb principle, uh, present participle that's being used as the noun in the sentence. So um, now the, this is what you have to remember with gerunds and I want you to write this down. It's only used as a noun, okay? What are your noun jobs? Think about your noun jobs in the sentence. They can be your subject noun, your direct object, indirect object, object of the preposition, object, complement noun, or predicate nominative. Those are all noun jobs. So these present participle gerunds, these verbs in their present participle form can take any of those jobs. They act as nouns in the sentence. So a noun job, all of those different jobs apply. Subject, direct object, indirect object, object of the preposition, object complement noun, and predicate nominative, okay? That's what you have to remember, all of these right here. These, your noun jobs, okay? All right, so let's look at some examples. The best way to look at this is examples. 
okay? So, first example is this being used as a subject, subject noun of your sentence. Voting was illegal in town, okay? So, right here, voting was illegal in town. Okay, so what was illegal in town? Voting, all right? To vote is a verb, that is a verb, to vote. And you have the present participle form here, voting, and that is being used as the subject noun of our sentence. What was illegal? Voting, subject noun, okay? All right, let's look at one where it's being used as the direct object. I love dancing. I love dancing, okay? So you guys see this right here? I love what? Dancing. Can dancing replace or rename I? Nope, so that's our direct object. Now to dance is a verb. To dance, dance dances, danced, dancing, danced. Right here we have present participle form, verb plus ing, it's being used as a noun job. That's our direct object, okay? That's a gerund. All right, let's look at one where it's being used as the indirect object. The judge awarded her cooking first prize. Okay, the judge awarded, now this one is a little bit harder to parse, okay? This is where the questions are really important. Okay, so the judge awarded her cooking first prize. Who awarded her cooking first prize? Judge, subject noun. What is being said about judge? Judge awarded, verb. Judge awarded what? What is the judge actually awarding? The prize. Can prize rename or, or replace judge? No, so it's your direct object. Your verb is verb transitive, okay? Awarded prize, remember that indirect object question is to or for whom or what. So judge awarded prize for what? Cooking. This one is indirect object. Now that is a little bit more obscure and I think that any of us, myself including, if I was parsing this sentence, I would have to really think about that for a few minutes because it's not as obvious as a lot of our SVT IODO sentences that we've had in the past, okay? Now her, this is possessive, who's cooking hers, that's an adjective. And then what kind of prize first, that's also an adjective. Okay, so you just have some modifying words there, but... So remember those indirect object questions, to or for whom or what? Awarded prize for what? Cooking. Now, this is a verb, to cook. This is the present participle form, cooking, and it's being used as a noun job, the indirect object. You guys see that? Okay. All right, let's look at one where it's being used as the object of the preposition. By studying, she passed the quiz or she passed the test. She passed the quiz. All right, so right here at the beginning of this sentence, we have a prepositional phrase that opens up our sentence. By studying, comma, she passed the quiz. The main sentence is she passed the quiz. It begins with this little prepositional phrase here. You have by, which is your preposition, and then studying is your object of the preposition. Now, to study is a verb. This is your um, present participle form, verb plus ing, and it's being used as a noun job, our object of the preposition, okay? All right, and then let me erase the word and I'll show you one of these gerunds being used in that last noun job 
of object complement noun. I don't think I have an example here of one being used. Oh, actually I do. Let's do predicate nominative and then object complement noun so you guys can see, see this being used in all of the different noun jobs. Her favorite hobby is you could put anything here, baking, reading, dancing. Okay, so um, her favorite hobby, her favorite hobby is baking. Okay, what, um, her favorite hobby is baking. The main sentence here is hobby, her hobby is baking. And whose hobby, her, this is an adjective. What kind of hobby or, or which hobby is um, favorite adjective. Hobby is our subject noun. What is baking? Hobby. Hobby. What is being said about hobby? Hobby is verb. Hobby is what? Baking. Can baking replace or rename hobby? Yes. Does hobby equal baking? Her hobby equal baking? Yes. The equal sign test works. So this is verb linking and this is predicate nominative. Now this right here is your gerund. Baking is the verb to bake. This is the present participle form, and it's used as a noun job there. It's used as the predicate nominative. Okay, and then last, that object complement noun. Okay, the teacher called his behavior cheating. Uh-oh. The teacher called his behavior cheating. Okay, who called his behavior cheating? Teacher, subject noun. What is being said about teacher? Teacher called, verb. Teacher called what? Teacher called behavior cheating. So behavior, can behavior replace or rename teacher? Nope, that's your direct object. Your verb is verb transitive. Okay, and then called behavior what? Cheating. This is your object complement uh, noun. Can behavior, can cheating rename behavior? Does behavior equal cheating? Yes. Um, this is being used as that object complement noun. It's the present participle form of to cheat, and it's being used as a noun job there. So this is our gerund right here, okay? Now, let's look at the way that we diagram these. If you look on your chart Q, um, you're going to also, uh, you know, with uh, writing your uh, adverb chart a couple times this week, um, don't forget about chart Q. Um, I don't have mine pulled out to lift it up to show you guys, but it's the chart that has the three different participles, or I mean verbals. So we did participle, infinitive, and this week is the last one, gerund. So write that chart a couple of times this week too. That is your chart Q. Um, it has the example of how you diagram all of these. Now remember these verbals have these funny little ways to diagram um, the participle, you know, it's that adjective. So whatever word it's going under, you have to put it on a curved line. And the uh, infinitive, you put it up on stilts and it has that line that looks like a check mark. Well, the gerund is also gonna go up on stilts but instead of being a check mark look, it's a little stair step, okay? So if I was gonna um, do that first sentence that we had, that I wrote you guys, voting was illegal in town. Remember my subject noun was the gerund voting, okay? So the way that this looks, for your diagram is you're still gonna start with your cross, okay? So your main cross, subject to the left, verb to the right. So my verb though of that sentence was voting, which is that, that uh, gerund. So I have to put it up on these little stilts with this little stair step, okay? And you're gonna start with the word voting and then kind of let it fall off their stair step. So it's gonna look a little bit like that. I don't know why, that's just the way that they do it. So gonna have that little gerund falling off the stair step. 
I guess maybe because it's an action word, so it's got some action even in its diagram. It's falling. Okay, so then your main sentence is voting was illegal. And then we had a little prepositional phrase under it. So in town, I'll go ahead and throw that one on there too. All right, so that's what that diagram looks like. Voting was illegal in town. Now, again, what is confusing and lovely and so much fun about these verbals is that because they are verbs, they retain, remember what um, Andrew Pudewa likes to call their verbiness, which means they sometimes can come to us in complete phrases with their own modifiers. That's where it can get confusing with these verbals. The verbals are, itself are not confusing, but because they are verbs, like I said, they have their own modifiers and things sometimes. They come to us as phrases, okay? So let's look at an example of this. Um, boiling an egg is difficult. Let's do that one. I have several examples here that I can show us, but let's look at that one. Okay, let me write this down. Okay, boiling, and if you wanna write it down too, hopefully y'all are still taking notes. Boiling an egg is difficult. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see pretty quickly in this sentence here boiling an egg is difficult, that we have an S-V-L-P-A, boiling equals difficult, okay. But are we just boiling? No, we are doing what? We're boiling an egg, all right? This whole thing is a phrase that is our subject now. Okay, that whole thing. That is what we are doing. Boiling an egg. What is being said about boiling an egg? Boiling an egg is. So we have this direct object here. Boiling what? An egg. And it goes with this gerund right here, which is our uh, present participle form of to boil. This is a gerund. It's our subject noun, but it has its own modifiers with it. So when we go to diagram this, it's gonna look like this. It's gonna be super fun. Let me show you guys this diagram. And this is what makes the verbals confusing is because they retain some of, they, they retain some of their verbiness and can come with their own direct objects and their own modifiers and things. So that's what your subject would look like. Boiling an egg. Do you see how it has, I had to make it look like that direct object it is difficult. Okay, so that's what it would look like. Okay, so let's look at another example. Swimming the English Channel is dangerous. Swimming, or you could even do something like swimming in the ocean is dangerous. Um, I think I got this directly out of our guide, so that's why it says swimming the English Channel. Swimming the English Channel, now if you guys remember from your geography, the English Channel is between England and France, and there is actually some people that have swum, uh, swam this and supposedly it's really rough waters it has a big current so okay so looking at this sentence written right here swimming the english channel is dangerous what is dangerous we're not just saying swimming is dangerous no what particularly is dangerous swimming the english channel this whole thing is our subject noun. What is being said about swimming the English Channel? Swimming the English Channel is. Swimming the English Channel is what? Dangerous. Can dangerous describe swimming the English Channel? Yes. Does swimming the English Channel equal dangerous? Yes. This is predicate adjective. Now this whole thing is our subject, subject noun. 
And you guys can see that gerund there swimming and it has its own direct object or yeah, swimming what? English Channel. So that's, what's that's what can be confusing. Now, what you have to be so concerned about or so careful of is that you don't mistake these gerunds for participles, okay? The participle is used as an adjective. These gerunds are used as nouns. So make sure that you are deciding, is it acting as an adjective in the sentence or is that participle, present participle acting as a noun? Okay, for example, um, and then also, this my example that I have written here is actually to differentiate between just a verb phrase and the actual participle. So let's look at the difference here. I'm going to write two sentences. The first one, mom is baking pies. Okay, so write that sentence. Mom is baking pies. And then below it, write the second sentence. My hobby is baking pies, okay? All right, so let's look at these two sentences, okay? So two sentences here, mom is baking pies, my hobby is baking pies, okay? So you guys should see that present participle glaring out at you very quickly. You have baking. Okay, well, let's look at the first sentence though. Molly, or mom is baking pies. Who is baking pies? Mom. Subject noun. What is being said about mom? Mom is baking. Okay, do you guys see that? Is baking. That is what mom is doing. She is baking. This is a verb phrase. This is a verb helping, and this is our verb. Is baking what? Pies. Can pies replace or rename mom? Nope. So this is a direct object, and this is our verb transitive. Okay, so in that sentence, is baking is a verb phrase. Baking is not a verbal participle there or a verbal gerund. It is actually the verb of the sentence. She is baking. That's what mom is doing. But look at the second sentence. My hobby is baking pies. Okay, my hobby is baking pies. What is baking pies? Hobby. Subject noun. What is being said about hobby? Hobby is. It's so hard to write while I'm holding this board like this. Hobby is what? It's not just baking and it's not just pies, but it is baking pies. Can baking pies uh, re uh, rename? Hobby? Yes. Does hobby equal baking pies? Yes. This is my predicate nominative and my verb is verb linking. We know that this is just an adjective. Whose hobby? My hobby. Okay. All right. So this baking pies here is a predicate nominative. So it is taking a noun job and it's a, it's a verbal gerund it has that present participle form baking and it has its own little direct object there baking pies okay let's diagram it go ahead and you start trying to diagram it on your own here let's do this diagram so start with your cross okay verb to the left hobby uh, I mean, uh, subject to the left, verb to the right, hobby is, you're going to have my as a modifier. Okay, and then for that predicate nominative, you're going to slant your line back. And then now we have to do this gerund. So we have to do some stilts with a stair step line. You're going to start with the word baking and then let it fall off the stair step. And then you're going to give it its direct object line because it has its own little direct object there. Okay, so that's what it looks like. My hobby is baking pies. And that's what it would look like. Okay, so gerunds are fun. Moms, I'm going to send you an email 
look for an email. I'm going to send your newsletters and your um, um, current assignment sheet. And I will send you a little packet that's all about these gerunds, just like I've sent you for the infinitive and for the participle. And it's just a helpful packet. Okay, so what I want us to do is one final sentence to put all of this together. This is going to have all of our different things. It's going to have our um, SVT IODO pattern. It's gonna have compound complex. It's gonna have a gerund. It's gonna have all the things, okay? So this is gonna be a nice big sentence for us to do here. So I'm gonna start writing it and dictate it to you. You can start writing this down, okay? So here's our sentence. Ed's cooking has improved. Ed's cooking has improved since he began reading those recipes. And he is bringing me a meal tonight. Okay, so this is a nice big sentence for us to work on. Ed's cooking. Okay, so let me hold it up. Get my knees up here to prop this up. My fun little board here. This is so fun. <laughs> okay, Ed's cooking has improved since he began reading those recipes and he is bringing me a meal tonight. Okay, so immediately let's look for some conjunctions. I see one right here. I'm gonna use my pink, it's a lot brighter. Okay, so since. So I know that since is one of my uh, www. That's a subordinate clause that's gonna introduce a subordinate um, clause there. So since he began reading those recipes, that can stand out to me now as a subordinate clause in there. Okay, so I can look before that and see my main independent clause, Ed's cooking has improved. That's the main sentence. And then it has a subordinate clause attached to it since he began reading those recipes. And then I also see a conjunction right here, and, okay? So these are both conjunctions. And he is bringing me a meal tonight. Okay, so lots of fun things in here. Okay, so now that I have some separation here with my clauses, I can start parsing. Okay, that one's not going to show up. Um, I want you guys to see this. I'll just have to keep using the pink because it's the one that I have here that's bright. Okay, so Ed's cooking has improved. Um, what has improved? Cooking. Subject, noun. Okay, but do you guys see this? All right, I just want to point that out to you, that ing, okay? Um, um, what is being said about cooking? Cooking has improved. It's not just cooking has. Cooking improved. It has improved. That's a verb phrase. Do you guys see it? So this is a verb helping, and this is my verb. All right, and there's actually no other nouns or anything but after that for me to um, do any more questions with, more, um, any direct object questions with. So this is a verb intransitive, okay? Who is cooking? Ed's cooking. This is an adjective, okay? Hopefully you guys can see all that. Ed's cooking has improved. All right, now let's do our subordinate clause here. Since he began reading those recipes, who began reading those recipes? He, subject pronoun. What is being said about he? He began, verb. He began what? What is it that he began? Reading those recipes. The whole thing is your direct object. Can reading those recipes replace or rename he? No, 
that is your direct object. Your verb here began as transitive. Okay, so reading those recipes is your entire direct object. You have a gerund participle here, reading. Reading what? Recipes. This is a direct object that goes with your um, gerund. And then that would be just an adverb that modifies recipes. I'll be able to show you that when we do our um, diagram. You'll see that all diagram together, but that whole thing is the direct object. Okay, he began what? Reading those recipes. All right, and then let's do our last phrase. He is bringing me a meal tonight. Who is bringing me a meal tonight? He, subject pronoun. What is being said about he? He is bringing, is bringing. This is a verb phrase. So you have a helping verb and then you have a verb. He is bringing what? Meal. Can meal replace or rename he? No, that's a direct object. Verb is verb transitive. Is bringing a meal to whom? Me, indirect object. Okay, bringing the meal when? Tonight, you have an adverb to say when he is doing the bringing. And then A is just an article there, okay? All right, so let's look at this all diagrammed out. And I'm actually going to hold my notes up so I don't have to do this on the board. Okay, so looking at this on the diagram for my notes here, okay? Remember I said that you have to put the um, independent clauses highest and then the subordinate clauses go lower in the diagram. So you see that here, your first independent clause, Ed's cooking has improved. So you have your cross, subject on the left, verb on the right, but you had a gerund here. So you have cooking up on the stilts falling off and then Ed's is below it, that's your modifier. And then has improved is your verb. Okay, then I did the second independent clause. He is beginning, is bringing me a meal tonight. Okay, so he is bringing indirect object meal, me, and the direct object meal. When is he doing the bringing? Tonight. So that adverb is below your um, verb there. All right, and then we are going to put the subordinate clauses lowest. So remember, independent clauses come highest in the diagram. And then, so we're going to have to do this long dotted line to connect. And I had to do it at an angle just because I couldn't come straight down. And that's fine if you have to do that. But it's um, has improved since he began. So it's verb to verb, since is written on the dotted line. And then you have that subordinate clause, he began reading those recipes. So subject, he, verb began, direct object, reading those recipes. Because it's a gerund, it has to go up on the stilts. And it is that verbal that has some of its own modifiers. So you have reading, falling off. Then you have the direct object line, recipes, and then an adverb below those recipes. And that's what that diagram would look like. Okay, now I'm going to show you one other uh, example that I had in my notes, and I'm just going to kind of show you in my notes so that I don't have to do all the writing out and we can speed this up here. But here's another sentence for you. Give swimming all your time and train diligently because God has given you a generous gift. Okay, so this is a commanding sentence. So your subject is going to be that implied you. You give, all right, give what? Time, direct object. Time for what? Swimming, indirect object. These are some adjectives. All the time, your time. You have a conjunction here and, okay, train diligently. This gets an implied you as well. You train diligently. This is another command. 
Okay, and this is a verb intransitive, train how, diligently, adverb. And then you have your last conjunction here that's, uh, it's a subordinating conjunction introducing that subordinate clause because God has given you a generous gift. God, subject noun, what is being said about God? God has given, verb helping, verb, given what? Gift, can gift replace or rename God? No, it's a direct object. Given a gift to whom? You, indirect object. What kind of gift? Generous gift. And then A is an article adjective. And then again, this is a diagram. So your first independent clause, you give swimming all your time. Implied you is your subject. Here's your um, gerund here, your indirect object. And then you have your second um, independent clause. You put the boy in his chair, fanboy in his chair, and then uh, train diligently. You train diligently. That's your second independent clause. And then you have to go do your um, last clause, your subordinate clause, lowest. Okay? Because God has given you a generous gift. All right, so that's another example sentence for you to look at. Okay, so the last thing that our, um, uh, the last thing that I had put in my notes in my lesson plans was for, uh, to look at this verb subjunctive mood. Um, that was something that's in the guide for you guys to look at. And moms, they have in the back of your guide, there's some extra charts um, that are just verb helps. And so maybe just take some time this week to kind of go over this with your student. Um, this is also part of your verb chart when they are talking about the verb moods. It's these three right here. But this chart right here kind of really breaks it down a little bit more with more detail, a lot more examples. And so this might be something good for you guys to just go over this week, just so your kids kind of have an introduction to this, um, the difference between these three moods. That was something else that the guide talked about doing this week. So but other than that, I think that we are done. And like I said, moms, I will give you, send you guys this uh, gerund packet. It's just like the other packets that I've given you so far. So this will be in your email along with your, um, newsletter and, and um, assignment sheet for this week. Okay. Other than that, um, I will send you guys a math game. I think that it's a good idea for you to keep reviewing your math facts. So if you haven't been able to increase your time a lot with doing the flipping the cards and practicing your multiplication facts, keep doing that till you can get um, faster and increase your time. I'm also going to send you um, a game that is just, it's, it's not really uh, mental math so much as it is just a very big brain exercise, but it's a, it's a card game called 30 Wonderful. And I'll send you that. It has the instructions listed. It might be a fun puzzle for you to do this week. And then I'm also going to send you the game called Algebra Top It War. That one, moms, you'll have to decide if you want to do because you'll have to print the little deck of cards. Um, we have done this game before, but it's it's where you have a variable. So um, you'll flip over two cards and roll the dice, and the card might say something like 8Y. And remember, whatever you roll on the dice is what you replace with that Y. And so it's just a good, um, it kind of quickly helps them convert and insert whatever number is on that dice into that variable and work a little simple equation. Um, so I'm going to send you those, look for those in your email, just some ideas for you to have some math game fun this week. Um, and then last but not least writing. So this is your last week to work on your final research project. Um, I would like for all of us to be able to get on a zoom call next week. Um, I think that we should set our time for two o'clock. So if anybody can't be on a zoom call at two o'clock, please let me know. But what I would love for us to be able to do is all meet together over the Zoom app. I'll send everyone an invite to our personal meeting. And um, that way, what we can do is give each student their turn to get in front of the screen 
and present their paper to us and read your research paper and then show whatever visuals you've come up with for your visual side of the presentation. So if that doesn't work for anybody, next Tuesday at two o'clock, uh, let me know. But that's what I would love for us to do is um, be able to meet next Tuesday at two o'clock and do our Zoom call to be able to present final research projects. Um, things to remember to finish up this week with your paper. Fill out the checklist. That checklist that I gave you, make sure that you go through your paper and fill out your checklist and score your paper and label all of your different dress ups and sentence openers and your vocabulary words. So make sure that you do that. Also, don't forget to attach a bibliography page. So you should have a separate page at the end of your paper that has your work cited, your all your bibliography information for the sources that you used. Okay, so don't forget to do that. You have to do that bibliography page. Um, and then just finishing up, you should have uh, five paragraphs. I think a couple of students have told me that they're only doing two body paragraphs. That's fine. If for the sake of time, just to get your paper done this week, you need to do two, then only do two main body paragraphs. You would end up with a four paragraph essay. Okay, you would have that introductory paragraph two body paragraphs, and then your conclusion paragraph. Um, all of the formats that you need are in your writing book. Um, what else, what else, what else? Um, even though we're not gonna be meeting face-to-face -face and you handing this paper in to me, I still think it would be nice for you to take this final paper and put it in a nice re report cover and, and have it all looking really professional um, because this is your you know, final end of the year project. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, for those that are doing the sentence challenge notebook, next week it is due. So if you are going to have a completed sentence challenge notebook, um, moms, you guys are gonna be the have to, have to be the one to really grade it and look through it and make sure that it is complete and check off every sentence that they are done correctly and complete. Um, so, if, if I'm gonna have any students with that completed uh, end of the year sentence challenge notebook, moms, I need you to let me know because that way I can have the, like uh, send them a prize in the mail. And then also I just wanna acknowledge it next week um, when we are on our Zoom call together as our final last day of class and last day being together. Um, I think that's everything I have. Um, and you know, I miss you guys and I think that y'all are doing a great job doing all of this at home. And uh, again, if you need anything, just let me know. But I hope that you guys have a great uh, last week this week. And, um, you know, I'm praying for you guys that everybody is staying healthy and happy as we are having lots of extra time at home. So have a great week and I'll hopefully, um, hopefully we'll get to be together again soon. But I'll talk to you later. Have a good day. Bye.